Please remain standing as we welcome up the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department Honor Guards to present colors. Please remain standing as we welcome our promise and liberty ponder to lead our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing as we welcome up Ms. Kay Ashley to sing our national anthem. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the You may be now be seated. I want to welcome you to the February special graduation here at Hope for Prisoners. I want to welcome all our friends, supporters, and collaborating partners, those of you who have come from near and have come here from far. We are very grateful that you've taken the time out as we celebrate these men and women who are taking the next step uh, to live life on a whole nother level. 
For those who may be new to Hope for Prisoners, I'll, I'll tell you who we are, what we do, and tell you some of the things that's brought us uh, to this day. Hope for Prisoners works with men, women, and young adults that are exiting different arenas of our judicial system. So some of the people that we work with, they come home from state or federal prisons, city, county jails, drug rehabs, halfway houses, transitional facilities, and the likes. And what we do is we provide the supportive services to help the men and women return them back to our community, not only get acclimated back into workplaces, but we make sure there's mechanisms in place that once they get inside those workplaces, through partnerships that we built up with employers here in our local community, they're gonna be afforded every opportunity to thrive and be able to grow and afforded every opportunity to succeed. We address the needs for them to get acclimated back in their family, which has been a missed mark of reentry, which seems like a, for, for a lifetime. It's like we never given the particular close attention to the men and women that are coming home from our prison systems and trying to get acclimated back into the community that is a huge, huge importance that we put an emphasis on them returning back to their family. The husbands returning back into their homes and wives and moms returning back into their, into their families, but particularly making sure there's a mechanism place in place to help with the, the family reunification component because if, if that piece is not right, if the home life is right, not right, everybody in this room can attest to the fact that everything else in the world has a tendency to fall apart. Then on the back end of the process, because it's a long-term 18-month journey where we walk with our folks, wanting to do everything we possibly can to ensure that we're helping them to be stand-up leaders in the community with an overall goal of them never, ever, ever reoffending again. I have a big passion for what it is that I do because I'm a formerly incarcerated person myself. I've been coming in and out of the system for decades, made a tre tremendous amount of mistakes trying to get life right. But God taught me very valuable lessons from all those mistakes that I made. And those lessons that I learned to help me to live life on a whole nother level. So what my passion in life is, the reason why I know that my God wakes me up every morning is to help other men and women who are facing those same challenges that I once had to face to do everything I possibly can to remove the barriers that's preventing them from being successful in life and to help to escort them up to a new level of life. Right. So I've, <clears throat> thank you. We founded Hope for Prisons back in 2009 when I first came home from prison. And since that time, we've had an opportunity to work with over 3,100 men and women have been through our process. And of those 3,100 women, that men and women that we've had the privilege to work with, a, a massive amount of those individuals successful in gaining full-time employment. Full-time employment and sustainable wage jobs where they could take care of themselves and take care of their family. And it has a recidivism rate that is so ridiculously low that it's caused another reentry mechanisms across this country looking for us to replicate our model all across the United States of America. We could not do that without the unprecedented support that we have for many of you right here in the room. The local people, uh, you know, collaborating partners, the churches that we work very closely, which was the foundation of what it is that we do, all of the second chance employers that many of you are here in this room today, and our graduates are gonna have an opportunity to walk away today with full-time sustainable wage jobs. But our biggest collaborating partnership, if you take a look around to see where we are today, we are in the headquarters of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and they are here today. We could not do that without the police department. You know, I have to tell you, because you look at all the police officers here in the room, never before in the history of reentry, nowhere on this planet, has law enforcement gotten this involved in mentoring and training men and women who are coming home from our prison system? And that partnership has ca is causing a win-win on both sides of the equation. Because if you think about it, if we're getting our men and women who are coming home from the prison system and we want them to get back out into the community and never reoffend again, Number one, we have to instill in them appreciation for the rules and regulations of our community. And we have found 
that that gets enhanced when they are in relationship with the men and women who are upholding the law. It gives me an honor and a privilege to introduce you to our first speaker. It's a man that I had an opportunity to sit into a Starbucks seven, eight years ago when we started ha having these conversations about what can law enforcement do to help men and women not go back to the prison system. And in that conversation, we, we talked about a, a, a myriad of different things. But the success of that, we could not even imagine that it would have been producing the intended effect that it's producing today. It gives me an honor and a privilege to introduce you to, from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, <laughs> Sheriff Kevin McMahill. Good afternoon. So uh, I'm, I only have like five minutes to speak, so buckle up, because I have a lot to say. Um, welcome, number one, on behalf of Sheriff Lombardo and the men and women of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department to our home. Thank you for being here, graduates. We also like to thank the president and our great mayor of the city of Las Vegas, Carolyn Goodman, for being here. Thank you very much. We can't forget why we're here, though. We're here for you, graduates. Congratulations to you on the first step of your journey. You are now part of the Hope for Prisoners family. You're part of something bigger than yourself. Many of you, this is probably the first time you've ever graduated from anything. This is the first step of a journey to becoming contributing members proud members of our community and giving back and taking those steps to take your life back. So congratulations to each and every one of you. <laughs> the question always comes is why does local cops have a role in prisoner reentry? That's a great question. I get it all from around the country and I can tell you the first step was as I began to arrest the children of people I arrested as a very young patrol officer. And I knew that something had to be done to break that cycle. And John Ponder came into my life. I had met many other folks that had been working in the prisoner reentry programs. And to be very candid with you, they had not helped a single individual. And when John came before me and asked me if we would participate with him, I immediately thought, no. But you can't tell John Ponder no, can you? <laughs> I think everybody in the room understands that. So we, we embarked on an unprecedented ask, which was, how do we get law enforcement to work with this population? And the reality of it was, for me, is to begin to understand something first and foremost. We had to move beyond you seeing me as a cop and me seeing you as a criminal. We had to get to a place where we saw one another as human beings first. I have never met a police officer that, have not, that got into this line of work for any other reason that they wanted to help. That's what we're here to do, and we are here to make your lives better. So the first thing that we see amongst one another is human being to human being connectivity. That is part of the secret sauce of the Hope for Prisoners program. <laughs> let, let me just simply say this to you. When you look at the criminal justice system as a whole, we spend a couple of dollars on prevention efforts. We spend a tremendous amount of money on a, a crime being occurred, an investigation being conducted, probable cause being established, an arrest being made, a trial being conducted, a conviction being had, and then housing so many folks in incarceration. And what I can tell you is, is that my men and women face people all day long who have failed in other parts of the social justice system. Fatherless families, poverty, mental health, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, you name it, that becomes our customer. And what I figured out was incarceration fixes absolutely nothing. Incarceration fixes nothing. So rather than having not spent a single dollar or invested in the human piece of allowing you to come home, because for years, what did we do? You came out, you went on parole, you went on probation, you were stuck right back into the same situation with no hope 
no opportunity, no, no chance at a meaningful wage to change your life and, and your family's life. And in, John enters with hope for prisoners. Today we have more jobs than we have returning offenders. We have to continue to build this process. I have to simply say to you that you are a part of something much larger than yourselves. Please don't ever forget that. Don't ever give up. And as you look all around this room, please take a minute to look to your left and your right, graduates. These are all people that are pulling for you and hoping for you, and God is on your side. So please make that commitment to yourselves. I have to wrap up, but I do want to simply say this to you. We're blessed to have Mayor Goodman here with us today. There's not a finer mayor on this planet. Um, she'll be coming up in just a minute after me to speak. And thank you for your support of LVMPD and our community efforts, Mayor. And then finally, I know the, the President is listening. And I just sim simply want to say thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you for your support of the men and women of law enforcement. Thank you for the work that you're doing with Mr. Kushner on criminal justice reform. Listen, folks, we live in a world of divisive politics, right? We live in a world where there are significant challenges. They're working on small things like Middle East peace, right? And then meanwhile, the president has been in Phoenix and California at rallies with thousands of people. Tomorrow he has a rally here in Las Vegas with thousands and thousands of people. Yet he took time out of his schedule to show up for you to tell you how important you are and how much you mean to the future of this program. God bless you. I just simply want to say his unwavering commitment to justice is greatly appreciated, and we're forever grateful for him coming here to this graduation. I wish each and every one of you the best. Metro will stand alongside of you and do everything that we can to make you and yours successful in the days to come. God bless each and every one of you. How awesome and a privilege to be able to call him my friend. You know, we're very privileged to uh, have the President of the United States here uh, with us today, as uh, Sheriff McBayhill had said, and I'm going to have the privilege of introducing him uh, here shortly. But first, uh, to I would love, love to introduce you to, and I call her America's sweetheart mayor. If you guys would please put your hands together for the city of Las Vegas mayor, Carolyn Goodman. Thank you. Okay, no, 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 sit down. I only have a few minutes. I've been cut down because the president's coming. How fabulous for us all. He does take priority, yes? Yes. So first of all, John, we gave him a key to the city. Why? Because he is outstanding. He has changed life, not only in our community for each of you, but for all your predecessors that are now part of this wonderful community and other communities. So the key to the city, to this great guy, and don't applaud, he accepts it. I don't want him to take my time. <laughs> so what was forgotten? I'm a big cleanup person. Part of all of this, and uh, Sheriff McMahill and our entire LVMPD, awesome, our faith initiative. My goodness, what would we do without our pastors, our ministers, our rabbis, so many people from the faith? God bless you all, because without faith, what do you have? You sure don't have hope, and you sure don't have the ability to get some higher up help. And even our president, I'm sure, looks up. So I just want to tell you, this is really to each of you and your family. And because of the bright lights, I can't see your eyes, which I love to see every time I come to a graduation of Hope for Prisoners. Nobody can choose what decade they're born in or to whom they're born or under what circumstances, what their gene pool looks like, and they have a propensity to have a great talent or no talent and can't sing, can't walk too well. The reality is, 
the one thing we all do possess once we get out of those very young years. And I said this to last week's graduation. Life is full of choice. And you have to get to the point through your experiences and your learning to love yourself, but knowing you're part of a greater population that needs you. And the fact that you have this pathway in this town created by this man and all of our wonderful law enforcement and faith initiative individuals who genuinely care about you. You have support. You will continue to have it. And uh, how am I doing on time, John? I just, I have to have every second, you know that. <laughs> my husband was mayor, and forget my husband, 12 years mayor. <laughs> he was a little crazy, and you know that for those of you who've lived here a while. Didn't want to have a business card, so he took a poker chip. He also talk, took showgirls and his Bombay Sapphire. We're not doing that. But his <laughs> business card was a $100 poker chip. And when it came time that he couldn't, as hard as he tried to get another term, he failed. My kids came to me and said, Mommy, you gotta run. We got a lot of egos running for this job, and they're gonna take his name off everything. They're gonna stop everything he's doing. I said, I'll run. If I win, $1,000 trip. <laughs> so, what's on here, though, is to tell each one of you, we have the faith in you. We believe in you. We need you, day by day, to stay the course, stay the choice that you're making every day. You can't point your fingers at somebody else. It all starts with the me in you. I am responsible for my choices. And so I am giving you, with Sheriff McMahill, as we somehow get through everything, and it's so exciting today, but we will be giving you this chip, or he'll give his own thing, I don't care. I'm giving you this chip, and it has the phone number of City Hall and the mayor's office. We are a hand up for you if you need it, beyond all that you know from all the people that have worked with you, counseled you, have given you now this opportunity to get back into life. You have your beautiful, beautiful families who adore and love you and know that you're coming home. So all I can tell you on behalf of the city of Las Vegas, we need you back helping us make this the remarkable community it is that's getting awards for everything day out and day in of different things we're doing to make life sensitive, worthwhile, compassionate for all. And it is right now today because of this man. So I just want to thank you all. God bless each of you. You know you can call. You will be heard. There is even an email site. No texting for me. We'll leave that to the president. So anyway, John, you're back up. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. A oh, fabulous, fabulous mayor. I'm going to ask the, the graduates to re remain standing um, as I uh, ask uh, Pastor Jabin Shabazz to move into position to pray when I introduce the uh, president. But what I'm going to ask the graduates to do is I want you to do this. Because a lot of times, things that happened to us in our past uh, could prohibit us from moving forward in our future. But you have to understand that our past does not define us. So what I want you to do is, I want you to take your hands and I want you to extend them right out in front of you. And I want you to fix your eyes in the palms of your hands. Down in the palms, fix your eyes down in the palms of your hands. And as you look at those lines in the palms of your hands, I want you to imagine, if you will, that each and every one of those lines represent things in your past that you're not proud of. Each of those lines represent things in your past that you wish had never happened. Each of those lines in your hands may represent a drug addiction. It may represent a, a, a period of incarceration. It may represent a, a broken relationship. They represent things in your past that you wish had never happened. 
Now I want you to lift your hands right up in front of your face. Fix them right in front of your eyes. And I want you to look at those things that you wish had never happened. Those things that you may be embarrassed about. Those things that, that people may continue to throw back up in front of your face. Now with your hands in front of your face, can you see me? No, with your hands in your face, can you see me? No, well, neither can you see your future with your past in your face. Hands down to the side, it's over. Now press on to that life God has in store for you. Mayor Goodman. It's my great honor to be able to give you your graduation oath. So if you will repeat um, your name when I say I, you give your first and second name, and I will repeat the oath to you. I, I. and your name. Hereby declare an oath in the presence of my family, friends, and all those present. Hereby declare an oath in the presence of family, my friends, and all present. That I will fully embrace this opportunity to a new life. That I will fully embrace this opportunity to a new life. From this day forward, I will, strive to be I will strive to be a productive, law-abiding member of my community. Law-abiding law member of my community. Be a person of honor and integrity. Be a person who sets positive examples for those around me. Be a person who sets positive examples for those around me. I will strive for all of these things. I for, for all of these, these things. things. As, I am, As I am. A person of value. A person, of value. A, person a person who takes responsibility. A person with self respect. A person with self respect. Who respects others. Who respects others. I will look toward the future. Having learned, from my past, having learned from my past, my determined purpose, my determined purpose from, this forward, from this point forward is to make the rest of my life, make make the, rest of my life the best of my life. So help me God. Congratulations. We are so proud of you, John. <laughs> you want me off the stage now? I'll go to the left. I'm going to ask you all to continue to remain standing as I welcome up Pastor James Shabazz to just uh, pray before I have the privilege of introducing the President of the United States. Almighty God, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you. We're especially grateful, Lord, for the mercy, the kindness, and favor that you've shown to our nation. Thank you, Lord, that year after year, decade after decade, you have blessed us so immensely. And for that, Lord, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for all of these graduates. I thank you that they all have a hope and a future. I thank you that they have a divine destiny, that you have a plan for their life. Lord, I thank you for these decisions that they have made um, to better their life. And Lord, I just thank you that you're going to honor that and you're going to honor them. I thank you for my friend John Ponder, and I pray that you would continue to bless him. Put your hand of favor upon him. I thank you that you have raised him up in our nation for such a time as this. Lord, I cannot wait to see what happens in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years through this incredible man and through Hope for Prisoners. We are all privileged to be a part of it. We are privileged to support it. We are privileged to be here just to witness your hand on John and Jamie and their family. It is a privilege. And Lord, we thank you for our president. We pray that you would continue to bless him. 
We pray that you would continue to give him wisdom and bring the right people around him at all times. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done through him and all you will continue to do through him. And Lord, we just give you all the thanks and all the praise in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Bless you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> thank you, Pastor Jabin. And I'm going to ask you guys if you will please continue standing. And I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me about uh, two and a half years ago. When I was privileged to receive an invite to the White House for the National Day of Prayer. And on this National Day of Prayer, it was such an honor to be recognized by President Donald Trump for the transformative power of Jesus in my life. And in the Rose Garden on that day, he told my story. He told my story about the power of prayer. And I remember when I came home, one of the things that really sticks out in my mind is as I walked up into my house, I had my wife and my two daughters tell me how proud they were of me. And my two-year-old daughter promised, with tears in her eyes, said that she cannot wait to get to her second grade class to tell the story about how her dad was with the President of the United States. Some months later, I was back in the White House for a meeting with President Trump and this administration. We were having conversations about criminal justice reform and, and prison reentry and, and how we could better serve people returning to our communities from across the country. And in this meeting, I had an opportunity to hear the heart of this President. I had an, had an opportunity to hear his commitment to the people that we love and the people that we serve. And on that day, I heard him make a promise. And him being here today is evident that the promise that he made was a promise that he kept. It gives me an honor and a privilege to not yet introduce, <laughs> and, this, and that is quite all right. I'm going to keep watching you. You can stretch it out because I'm going to use this opportunity to, to tell you some other things that took place on the National Day of Prayer. When I was in that room and just honored, I was honored to be there with my very first law enforcement friend, FBI agent Richard Beasley, who's, who's here in this room today. And the president told the story of how God used him. As First Colossians says, the Colossians says in 113 that God snatches us out of the kingdom of darkness and conveys us into the kingdom of the son of his love. And she's going to keep, I will keep going. I am behind a podium. There's a pastor up inside me. I will have a bucket being passed inside this room. No problem. So I'm going to keep you guys up on your feet. One of the things that's just so very impactful about this president and how you could see how he's impacting the criminal justice system in this country. And if I may say, in my lifetime, I have not seen another sitting president move with this much compassion when it comes to the people in the reentry community. When we're talking about employment opportunities to when today we are sitting in more jobs right now than we can fill. And these are not minimum wage jobs. These are jobs where people are earning sustainable wages. I remember when Hope for Prisons first got going back in 2009, I could not get people who were turning home from prison, uh, jobs more than 825 doing telemarketing. You cannot take care of yourself and your family at that, with, that, with earning that. But today, again, and many of those employers are right here in this room, some of the largest employers, that they're earning sustainable wages. And when we started out on our mission, because the mission of our organization, we're looking to change the face of reentry. We want to change what it means to be people coming home from the prison system that are truly fighting for a second chance. And the only way we're gonna be able to do that is to help to create a massive amount of people who come home from our prison system 
and not only do they never reoffend again, that they begin to live levels of life that most people only dream of. If we train and we equip, training and equipped people to get into our community after serving their time in the prison system, and they are not liabilities, but they can be tremendous assets to our community, then it increases the probability of them being full-time employed. You know, I have a dream that one day, you know how folks, you know, graduate from college. And when they graduate from college with the high grade point average and they send headhunters out to pick them up because they want the brightest and sharpest individuals to be talented inside their organization. Well, I have a dream that one day we'll be able to do that for men and women returning back to our communities from, from the prison system. That if, as long as we can train them and we equip them and provide them with these things prior to them being released, going into the system early on, and do the vocational training to provide them with the substance abuse uh, uh, treatment and, and all the leadership trainings, teaching them, number one, how do you lead yourself? How do you get those results that you've always wanted to get out of life? How do you be that leader in your family? And ultimately, what does that look like for you to be a stand-up leader in the community, making an impact? It is something that we all should pay close attention to. Sometimes we hear people say, well, we, we can't do that for this segment of the population. We don't have the funding for everybody to do that. But my question is, what is it costing us not to do it? When you think about it, it's simple. When we can help our men and women returning back to the community, be equipped to be successful and we take every ounce of energy that we can muster and pour into their lives. 2.3 million people incarcerated in our prison system. Right here in our local community, more than 6,000 individuals return back to our communities from the Nevada Department of Corrections. Coming home to what? The Federal Bureau of Prisons last year released almost 690, almost 700 people back into our community coming home to what? And right here in our local community, it's over 200 men and women a day are released from our detention center. Coming home to what? Coming home to this never ending vicious cycle called recidivism. And that is what the mission of Hope for Prisons is. That's what the mission of our collaborating partners is, to disrupt that vicious cycle of recidivism. And if we do that with effectiveness, think about this, then we're reducing the future victimization of our community. Where we're helping men and women return back to the community and get sustainable full-time employment then them getting back to work is adding fuel to the economic engine of our community. That's why we should give it that support. And now she stretched it out a little bit more. That's good. What I want you to do is take your Bibles. <laughs> and open it up to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. <laughs> It is appropriate fitting to, to say that today because it says that God has a picture-perfect plan for your life. He has a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. It's a plan to give you a hope and to give you a future. And as you're trudging forward in life, you may be looking back thinking about, why have I been through what it is that I've been through? Looking back in life and, you know, why have I been through this? But I'll share with you a passage of scripture, my favorite script passage of scripture, that made life make so much sense to me. In Romans 8, 28 and 29, it says this. All things work together for the good, for those who love God, and those who are called according to his purpose. And in that passage of scripture, it says all things. 
It does not say some things. That passage of scripture says all things work together for the good for those who love God. And I don't know about you or anybody in this room, but I have found myself in some situations in life that were not very good. I found myself in situations in life, as a matter of fact, they were atrocious. I found myself in situations in life that prior to going into this situation, I was saying that if something like that has ever happened to me, I don't know how we would deal with it. I could never go and do anything like that. And then I found myself smack dab in the middle of that thing that I never wanted to go through. And I'm asking God, how could this work together for the good? It is simple. How that works together for the good is when I allow God to pull me through that. Because I couldn't get through it myself. But when I allow God to pull me through that thing that I never wanted to get through, and I'm standing on the other side of it, dust myself off, it works together for the good, graduates. When you have an opportunity to turn right back around, and help someone else through the same thing that you're just going through. That's what the other side of it looks like. That's, that's what it, it, you know, where it all works together for the good. Because by doing that and going through that and God bring you through that, when, when you help turn around and help someone else through it, then you have a chance to, to minister to them, to, to attend to that need. Because you know exactly what it is that they need because you've been through it yourself. Should I say it slower? Because you've been through it <laughs> yourself. Well, I could stay up here all day long. And ushers, would you please get the buckets <laughs> ready? And this is where it all just, it makes sense. So on this journey that you're about to embark on on this day, there's going to be things that you are going to go through. Remember what that feels like. There's going to be challenges that you're going, to, you're going to face. I want you to remember what that feels like. There's going to be ups and downs that you're going to experience. Please remember what that looks like. And I can tell you from my own personal experience that reentry does not look like this. Reentry looks like this, which is why it is so important that you stay connected with our organization because we want to be there with you through that. We're going to start this 18 month journey with you. We're going to surround you with the support that you need to help you to be successful. We're going to attach you to, to mentors that have been there and done that to be able to help you to navigate whatever challenges you're going to be facing during that reintegration process. We need you. Your family needs you. Your community needs you. When I first founded Hope for Prisoners back in 2009, I had people saying to me, why are you naming this organization Hope for Prisoners? They said, don't name it Hope for Prisoners because prisons has that negative connotation about it. So people are not going to want to donate to prisoners. Why would you name it Hope for Prisoners? And I said to him, well, the reason why I named it Hope for Prisoners is because I know God dropped that name in my spirit before I walked out 50-foot walls. But the other reason I said, I told them that we're going to name it Hope for Prisoners, I said it's simple. <laughs> it's the mission of our organization is to help to create a massive amount of people who come home from the prison system, and not only do they never reoffend again, that they begin to live levels of life that most people only dream of, and then they become the hope for the prisoners. <laughs> there are formerly incarcerated people all over the world watching this today. What's happening today is going to go into prison systems all over the world. They're going to read those newspapers, and you're going to encourage them. 
They're going to they're read the newspapers and see that the President of the United States was here for you today, and that's going to encourage them. I remember my trip back from the Rose Garden, and the very first time I took a trip into one of the prisons here in Nevada Department of Corrections, I walked into a room with hundreds of inmates in this room. And as I walked in the room, they, they held up the newspapers. And they whispered with tears in their eyes that I want to be just like that right there. I said, you have an opportunity to do that. You have the opportunity to spend every waking moment of your time to surround the issues, to address the issues surrounding the circumstances that led to your incarceration. And I told them that if they just give God enough of their time, that God can do some absolutely amazing things with their life. It gives me an honor and a privilege to stand before you, to introduce to you our great president. It was not many years ago when I was behind 50 foot walls in a maximum security United States federal penitentiary. And coming home from the prison system and digging trenches to, to, to help put together this thing called Hope for Prisoners. I could not do it without garnering support. And we had done a fabulous job garnering that support right here in our local community until I had an opportunity to get an invite to the White House. And when I walked into that room and was surrounded by members of this president's cabinet, when I sat at the table with some decision makers and they invited me into the room to, to get my input, asking me what it was that I was able to bring to the table. And everything that I shared with them, we're living in the middle of this right now. Honored that we had his ear. And again, every single promise that was made by the president of the United States. Graduates, he's here today. And those promises that he made was a promise that he kept. If you guys will please put your hands together for the 45th president of the United States of America, President Donald J. Trump. John's been doing this for 11 years, and he's done incredible, and so many people have such respect for him, and uh, I shouldn't tell you this. Should I tell it to you now, or should we wait? So they're all saying he's done so well. He saved so many lives. He's created uh, happiness in so many families. Sir, would you consider John Ponder for a full pardon? Um, I love doing it. I love doing it. And we are, we are giving him absolute consideration. And I have a feeling he's going to get that full pardon. I have a feeling. I can't tell you, but I have a feeling. Come here, John. Great gentleman. First thing they said to me when I walked in, 
And, uh, but everybody knows who you are. I know who you are. 11 years of this, that's fantastic. What a tremendous story. Thank you very much, congratulations, because I'm gonna give him an early congratulations, all right? That's big stuff, that's big stuff. So thank you very much, John. And two years ago, I was honored to celebrate your story of faith and transformation as you stood with me in the Rose Garden of the White House. It was a great day, a beautiful day. Now I'm thrilled to come to Las Vegas Police Department. And thank you very much for being what a group that is. That's some job you guys do. Some job you do. A lot of friends, too, a lot of friends. To take part in your organization's Hope for Prisoners graduation ceremony. We are here to reaffirm that America is a nation that believes in redemption. And that's what it's about, redemption. We believe in second chances. And we want to bring returning citizens, great people. Great people, in many cases, great people. And not in all cases. I'm not going to be too politically correct, <laughs> fellas, right? Not in all cases. But in many cases, we want to rebuild their lives. They want to rebuild their lives. They want to help us and rebuild our country. And please, everybody, please sit down. It's a little bit late with that one, wasn't it? Thank you. That feels better, doesn't it, huh? But to the 29 graduates who are returning to your families, you have paid your debt to society and shown a commitment to change. You've overcome many challenges, broken free of addiction, learned new skills, and replaced old habits with fresh resolve. And John told us just outside a little while ago that it's, a, it's an incredible class, incredible class of talent. That word talent is very important. And now you have a chance to begin a new chapter that you are proud to call your own. And I have little doubt you're going to be very, very successful. Your future does not have to be defined by the mistakes of the past. Today, we declare that you are made by God for a great and noble pur purpose. And you understand that. I mean, it's a great and noble purpose. And you're valued members of our American family. And we are determined to help you succeed. And we're going to work with you. And you're going to work with John and everybody else in this really incredible place that you've all put together, John. And uh, you're going to be so successful. You're going to say, I'm going to be more successful than Trump. <laughs> going to be more. And I'll be happy if you do it. I'll tell you what. I'll be very happy about it. But as long as you work hard and follow the law and do your part to contribute to your communities, your best days are just beginning. Best part of your life is beginning. I really believe that. And your greatest years are just ahead. And to all of the family members and loved ones who have been through so much, of the graduates who join us today, we know your journey has not been an easy one, but your love and support make all of the difference. And we are tremendously grateful for the families, the loved ones. And I know they're even more grateful. Because without them, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. So I want to thank you. And joining us for this ceremony are two leaders who have devoted so much to advancing medical cures to help people overcome the stranglehold of addiction, Sheldon and Miriam Adelson, and they've been great friends of mine for a long time. Stand up, Sheldon. What a family. What a family. And Miriam is a doctor, a great doctor. She doesn't have to be a doctor. You can trust me, her husband doesn't need the money. But she devotes her life, it's the most important thing to her, to addiction. And uh, every time she learns something new, and there's still plenty to learn, but she'll call me and tell me what they're learning about addiction and the job you do, Miriam, and what you've done, Sheldon, just overall is incredible. And uh, really good. Two great people, just great people. And they like a place called 
Israel very much. Would you say that's correct? Maybe I have to use the word love, a place called Israel, right? In your case. Thank you as well to Las Vegas Mayor Carolyn Goodman for being here. Carolyn, thank you very much. Great, great job. And also the tireless advocate, because uh, Carolyn has been very much involved with criminal justice reform, along with Jared Kushner, who's been very, very much involved. I don't know. I think, I think Jared, I'm starting. Where is Jared? Thank you, Jared. Look at him. He never wants any credit. He does a lot. He works hard. But that's working out very well, Carolyn, isn't it? It's working out well for everybody and tremendous uh, support. And we had liberal support. We had conservative report, support. And they came to me, and they needed some help. And uh, we got help from some very unexpected places, votes. We needed votes. And we got some great people, Republicans in all cases in this case. But we got some great people to vote for criminal justice reform. So in fact, very conservative Republicans. So that was a, a good sign. Uh, very bipartisan. And it was a terrific thing, and we really uh, — we did something that they've been trying to do for a long time, and we got it done. We get a lot of things done. A lot of things done. Now, you see a lot of uh, press back there. So before we go any further, I want to address today's sentencing of a man, Roger Stone. Roger Stone. He's become a big part of the news over the last little while. And I'm following this very closely, and I want to see it play out to its fullest, because Roger has a very good chance of exoneration, in my opinion. I've known — and you people understand it probably better than anybody in the room. I've known Roger Stone and his wife, who's really a terrific woman, for a long time. And Roger is definitely a character. Everybody sort of knows Roger. Everybody knows him. And most people like him. Some people probably don't. But I do, and I always have. Uh, he's a smart guy. He's a little different. But those are sometimes the most interesting. But he's a good person. His family is fantastic. He's got a fantastic family. And there's always a reason for that, isn't there? Roger was never involved in the Trump campaign for president. He wasn't involved. I think early on, long before I announced, he may have done a little consulting work or something. But he was not involved when I ran for president. And he's a person who, again, he knows a lot of people having to do with politics. His whole life is politics. That's what he is. And it's my strong opinion that the forewoman of the jury, the woman who was in charge of the jury, it's totally tainted. When you take a look, how can you have a person like this? She was a anti-Trump activist. Can you imagine this? <laughs> now, you wouldn't know about a bad jury. Anybody here know about bad? No? <laughs> These people know more about bad juries than everybody here, including the sheriff and the mayor and everybody. <laughs> they know about bad juries. We're not going to say it too much. So let's not say it in front of more cameras than this. <laughs> but you're my experts, OK? No, but this is a woman who was an anti-Trump person, totally. Now, I don't know if this is a fact, but she had a horrible social media account. The things she said on the account were unbelievable. She didn't reveal that when she was chosen. And she's, I guess, from what I hear, a very strong woman, a very dominant person. So she can get people to do whatever she wants. And she got on, then she became the four-person, four-woman on the jury. And I assume they asked her a question. Do you have any bias? Do you have any? She didn't say that. So is that a defrauding of the court? You tell me. But does this undermine our fair system of justice? How can you have a person like this? Did she delete her social account? And when Roger was determined by the same jury to be guilty before the judge issued a sentence. And he was determined to be guilty. And she started going a little wild. She's very happy. And 
she started saying things that people said, that's strange. That's strange. And then they started looking at, now how can you have a jury pool tainted so badly? It's not fair. It's not fair. And you know, it's not happening to a lot of other people. Because you could look, I won't name names, but everybody knows who I'm talking about. What's happening over there? Nobody. Nobody. There are people that are, even in Roger Stone's basic business of politics, that were going to be in big trouble. Well-known people, the biggest people, big trouble. They were forced to leave their firm. One man was forced to leave his firm, and he was going to, bad things were going to happen to him the following day. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. He was the biggest. Nothing happened. But it happened to Roger Stone, and it happened to General Flynn, and it happened to, I won't name names, it happened to a lot of people, <laughs> and destroyed a lot of people's lives. And I'm here to make a fair system. Again, Roger is, is not somebody who worked in my campaign. I know Roger, but a lot of people know Roger. Everybody sort of knows Roger. And what happened to him is unbelievable. They say he lied. But other people lied, too. Just to mention, Comey lied. <laughs> McCabe lied. Lisa Page lied. Her lover, Struck, Peter Struck, lied. You don't know who these people are? Just trust me, they all lied. <laughs> You had people that forged documents. You had people that wrote fake dossiers and brought them to the FBI and used people in the Justice Department to get them to the FBI. And these people know in the front row, you know better than anybody in this room what the hell I'm talking about, probably. <laughs> so I'm only responding to you. I'm not even talking to the folks out there. But they get it better than anybody, too. A lot of bad things are happening, and we're cleaning it out. We're cleaning the swamp. We're draining the swamp. I just never knew how deep the swamp was. So if this woman was tainted, I hope the judge will find that she was tainted. And if she isn't tainted, that will be fine, too. But I'm not going to do anything in terms of the great powers bestowed upon a president of the United States. I want the process to play out. I think that's the best thing to do, because I'd love to see Roger exonerated, and I'd love to see it happen, because I personally think he was treated very unfairly. They talk about witness, witness tampering, but the man that he was tampering didn't seem to have much of a problem with it. I think they know each other for years, and it's not like the tampering that I see on television, when you watch a movie, that's called tampering. With guns to people's heads and lots of other things. So we're going to see what it is. Maybe there was tampering and maybe there wasn't. But I can tell you that there was tremendous lying, really lying and leaking classified documents. That you don't know about. But they leaked classified documents. You know, there was a young sailor who took pictures of an old submarine and sent them to his mother and a friend. And they destroyed his life. I let him out. They were considered classified. Now, Russia and China, I guarantee you, have the pictures of this submarine for a long time. The submarine was like 30 years old. They had them in the uh, first year. They didn't have to wait for the 30th year. But this is a famous story. And they had his pictures, and they put him in jail. He sent them to his mother and to his friend. His friend was not interested in what you're thinking. And there were many other cases where documents were leaked, even accidentally. It's so classified documents are so important that even if they are leaked accidentally, now Hillary Clinton leaked more classified documents than any human being, I believe, in the history of the United States of America, right? And she deleted 33,000 emails. 
And she said, oh, and by the way, if you did it five years, maybe more, okay? But you'd never have access to classified. Very few people have access. She deleted 33,000 emails. I kept waiting. Because, you know, they can talk Benghazi. They can talk a hundred different things. What people understand is when you get rid of this kind of evidence, so the United States Congress said they subpoenaed her. They wanted to see her emails. After getting the subpoena, she deleted 33,000 emails. And they said, you remember this? Yes, the emails were about her yoga classes, her exercising, and her daughter's wedding. 33,000 about her daughter's wedding. That must have been the greatest wedding of all time. And nothing happened to her. And yet they'll put a young sailor in an old submarine with a picture, a couple of pictures. They'll put him into jail. And I pardoned him because it was unfair that she was able to do it at the highest level. And his level wasn't, what he did was, it was confidential. Confidential is a much lower class than classified. So I tell you this because it's interesting. This is part of our nation. This is what's going on now. So I'm going to let this process play out. And we want to have a great and fair court system. And I hope you had a fair and, you know, fair and wonderful court system. But perhaps you didn't. Perhaps you didn't. And if you didn't, we want to straighten it out. But we have to straighten it out also at the top level. So we had a lot of dirty cops. FBI is phenomenal. I love the people in the FBI. But the people at the top were dirty cops. And if you would have read the report written about Comey, 78 pages of kill with a reference of, go get him. They really said it, go get him. And then you read about McCabe, and you see what they said, so bad. And we're just waiting. I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting here, standing here, talking to you. We're waiting. So I just want to uh, let the fake news media know <laughs> that I just want to let them know, because there's few people more dishonest than these people, I will tell you that. And you have some very good ones. A hell of a lot more dishonest than most of you in the audience were. <laughs> But I'm going to let the media know that uh, I'm going to watch the process. I'm going to watch it very closely. And at some point, I'll make a determination. But Roger Stone and everybody has to be treated fairly. And this has not been a fair process, OK? Thank you. So when I ran for president, I pledged to fight for those who have been forgotten, neglected, overlooked and ignored by politicians in our nation's capital, and you understand that very well. For decades, no one was more forgotten than citizens coming out of prison who were ready to go into a brand new beautiful start but couldn't find a job. They couldn't find people who believed in them. And one of the great things that happened is I and my administration and a lot of very talented people that work with me, we created the strongest economy in the history of our country. We have the best unemployment numbers. We have the best unemployment numbers for African American, best in history. Asian American, best in history. Hispanic American, best in history. Our country is booming. We've never done better. It's the best economy we've ever had. So when people come out, as an example yourselves, you're going to get great jobs. And I'll tell you the end result, and we do studies on this. People with businesses are going to hire you. They want you more than you want them. This is the first time this has happened. OK? This is the first time. They want you to do it. And they wouldn't have given you that second chance. We call it second chance. But they wouldn't have given you that second, in some cases, a third chance. That's OK. But they wouldn't have given you that second chance. Now they're doing it because they need people, because the economy is so good. And I'll tell you the end result. Employers are calling the numbers that we're getting, the respect that you're getting from people that are doing the hiring. They can't even believe it. 
I had one gentleman, I talked to him, had seven people came out of prison. He's got seven people working for him. He said, they're among my best. He said, they are among my best people. He said, I cannot believe it. And you know what? Some, this doesn't always work out. I'm not going to say everybody is perfect. It's not. Nobody's, uh, you take a group, there's always going to be some, somebody doesn't work out. But he said, I can't believe it. They are, he's got seven now. They've been with him for quite a while. He said, they're among the best people I've ever employed. He is so happy. It's going to happen with you. It's going to happen with them. What do you think? I think it's going to happen with this group. So once I came into office, leaders from all different backgrounds asked me to make changes to our criminal justice system. And the more I learned about the issue, big issue, the more I knew that criminal justice reform was really not about politics, because you have people that are for and against it on all different levels, Republican, Democrat, conservative, independent, liberal. Some love it, some don't love it. But they're starting to love it. We're having tremendous success with it. And it's about doing the right thing. Because Alice Johnson, you know, I've really gotten to know her well, and she's like an incredible person. And because of Alice, we're taking in, we've just let out three other people that she knew. And I say to people, and you may have references and recommendations when you were, wherever you may have been, frankly, you know some people that were really good people who, Alice was in for 22 years. She had another 18 years to serve. And for a crime, but not that kind of a crime. And. I learned about Alice Johnson, and when I learned, uh, it really, uh, you know, it was really something special. She's an incredible woman. She came out of prison. You've seen the whole thing. We actually did a commercial on it. I did the commercial for people to see what this was all about. She came out. You couldn't hire an actor in Hollywood to have the emotion and the love and the tears and everything. She came out, and she saw her family who had totally grown up without her. And some big, strong young men, some wonderful women, just all family. And she was grabbing them, and they were all hugging and kissing outside of this massive prison wall. And they were just screaming with joy. It was an incredible thing to see. I, you, couldn't, you couldn't do it. It had to be natural. It had to come from the heart. It had to come from the heart. So it was always, so I say to Alice, and I say to other people, and I'll say to you, and I'll say to you, you're going to have some recommendations. You think I'm making a mistake with him? What do you think? Okay. But you're going to have some recommendations. I want your recommendations. Because you have, we have thousands of people in prison that have stories like Alice Johnson. Thousands and thousands of people. And I love doing it. I love doing it. And, you know, you can be poor. You can be middle income. You can be rich. It's injustice is injustice. But you have thousands of people that shouldn't be there. And I love finding those people. So as you find them, as you really think, but you can't let me down. they got to be right. Because there are some people you don't want to do this with. You do know that. I said to Alice, so Alice, let me ask you. You have a lot of people like yourself, right? Yes. But you have bad people too, don't you? Yes, we do. Some very bad people. I said, good. Because I wouldn't want somebody to say, no, everybody's good, because that's not the case. But she's given us great recommendations, and she's a great woman. To redress unfairness in the justice system, just over one year ago, I led the effort to pass the criminal justice reform. And others had tried and failed. They didn't try too hard, because they know it couldn't be done. But we got it done. This law rolls back provisions of the really terrible 1994 criminal Clinton crime law that disproportionately impacted the African-American community. I mean, they like Clinton. But they passed a law that was a disaster. You know that. But we did something about it. They were unable to do it all the way back. We did something about it. And my recent budget provides over $400 million to expand vocational training, drug treatment, and critical reentry programs just like this one. Okay? You know that. He knows it.
By enacting criminal justice reform, we're sending a powerful message to prisoners who have reformed their lives. When you return to society, we are not going to leave you behind. We're not leaving you behind. But now we don't have the excuse of a bad economy. They used to have the excuse, well, we can't do it. The economy is no good. The unemployment rates were very high. We're down to 3.5 percent. We're probably going lower. And wages are going up. First time in 21 years, they're really going up and going up. It's a beautiful thing. If you're like in my world, it's a beautiful thing to watch. It's like a picture. Everyone in this room is here to make sure that you have the support that you need to succeed, thrive, and to never, ever look back. You're not going to look back. We're not going to look back. And we're joined today by many great pastors and faith leaders, some of whom I know pretty well, who trust the power of prayer and the mercy of God to transform their lives. And I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you. Great, great faith leaders. Thank you. Please stand up. Please stand up. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Great job. I've actually been to a couple of their churches. Thank you very much. Also with us are employers of many different industries who are here to recruit you. Don't ask for too much. Just take it nice and easy. <laughs> Don't forget, they want to make a good deal, but you do too. <laughs> but they want to recruit you for great jobs, and they're here. Who are the people that are looking? Who are the people, the employers? Please, yeah, stand up, please. That's great. That's great. That's great. Great. You're going to be happy. You're going to be very happy, including the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce, who really has done a fantastic job over the years. I've known how hard they work and what a great job they do. Stations, casinos, Martin and Harris Construction, Civil Work General Contractor, Silver State Transportation, Keolis Transit and Workforce Connections, and I want to thank you all. And we have a lot of others outside that are coming in, too. And you're going to have a lot of, uh, you're going to have a lot of fun. It's, it's nice to be loved, right? It's nice to be wanted. You're wanted. You're wanted. Finally, you are. You're wanted. Right, John? Finally, we're proudly, really proud to be joined by more than 80 men and women these people are so incredible of law enforcement. The job they do, Sheriff, the job. Please stand up. You don't know how much people respect you. You don't hear it. You don't hear it. People respect you like you wouldn't believe. So we just want to thank you all. The job you do is incredible. Law enforcement, we honor your selfless service and bravery. By the way, fire department also. I just left an area of the country where two firemen were just killed. And uh, terrible. Uh, up in a certain portion of a beautiful place in California where a building collapsed, two people killed, two firemen killed. And we honor them. And we uh, it took place yesterday. But uh, they're fantastic. But I want to thank law enforcement, because the job you do is incredible. And the, the respect that people have for you, you'll never, you'll never know how strong it is. It's stronger. And I think it's stronger now than ever before. And now you have an administration that loves you, backs you. We give you the equipment that you need. We gave billions of dollars of equipment. We had surplus equipment, military equipment, incredible stuff, sitting in hundreds of warehouses all over the United States. And for some reason, other people didn't want to give it out. But I gave it out. And I s assume you got some of it, right? You got some of it? I know the man. He probably got most of it, right? <laughs> That's good. It keeps you safe. As you know, Hope for Prisoners has pioneered a mentorship program with law enforcement, which has given strength and support to former inmates like Lois Hockersmith, and she joins us today. Lois. Where's Lois? For many years, Lois struggled with addiction. 
in May of 2012, she found herself pregnant and in jail. After she served her time, Lois participated in Hope for Prisoners program. She graduated in 2013, and since then, Lois has stayed totally sober. She's earned back custody of her precious, beautiful son. And she is one of the best case managers here at Hope for Prisoners. Is that right? That's good. That's good. Thank you. Come on up here, Lois. Come on up here. Through it all, Lois has been encouraged by her mentor, who is the same officer who arrested her nearly eight years ago, Lieutenant Steve Ryback, who also joins us today. Hey, Steve, come on up. Is Steve here? Steve is here. Steve, come up. Um, so first of all, I want to thank this officer. Um, he saved our lives that night that he arrested me and my son. He arrested me. <laughs> Here, I was pregnant with him, and uh, I gave birth to him that night. And not all our heroes wear capes, some wear badges. Had he not been doing his job that night, I wouldn't be here. Um, John Ponder, <laughs> listen, we've been through a lot of things together. Uh, 2012, that's when I went through the program. My life changed that day. I am standing in front of the president, a little bit nervous. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just want you to know that I'm standing amongst heroes, but you guys, if it wasn't for you guys to come back in and for me able to pour back into you, this is how I keep it, by giving it back to you guys. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. President. Take care of mom, right? Huh? Beautiful. Beautiful. He feels very comfortable. You I had a well-prepared speech for this. Uh, the credit, 100%, goes to Lois. And uh, to be completely candid, I, I was doing nothing no different than I had done for years and years that night. Uh, I definitely believe it was divine that we came across each other. But uh, the credit goes to her. Uh, the credit goes to John. The credit goes to you guys as 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 hopefuls, and I uh, just wish you a tremendous amount of success in the rest of your life. It's only forward at this point, and uh, you have an incredible team, an incredible community, and I'm so honored to be a part of it. But again, the credit goes to these people right here. Thank you. That was a good job. That was a good job. Wow. He did okay, fellas, right? He did okay. <laughs> he did a great job. Thank you both. Lois and Steve. You remind us, really, that uh, all of us, that anything's possible. And Lois is among the roughly 100 Hope for Prisoners alumni here today, all of whom are doing incredibly well. Please stand. Please stand, all of the alumni. Wow. That's great. That's great. That's great. Great. Congratulations. Thank you very much. But they're really a testament to the bright future that awaits you all. It's, uh, it's, in a great, it's a great time in our country, so many ways. Our military is strong. Our, our country is just strong. We're stronger in, I would say, just about every way than we ever have been before. Militarily, you take a look at what we're doing with the stock market. We've had 144 out of three years. I've been here just a little more than three years. And in a little more than three years, John, we've had 144 stock market records. Now, that's good for everybody. It's good for your 401ks, and it's good for jobs, and it's good for those are the ones I think about first. Jobs, 401ks, and that. And people are making a lot of money, and people are getting Tremendous. You'll be investing some of your money in this now. You'd be doing fantastically well, and you're going to have 401ks or something, the equivalent, and you're going to do fantastically well. And, you know, as I say sometimes in speeches, the best is yet to come. We have tremendous potential. We have tre we've just made some incredible trade deals that will soon start kicking in. It's going to make it a different country 
economically. As good as it does, it's going to be much better. We had horrible, horrible deals, or no deals at all. And now we have phenomenal deals. We made a massive deal with China. Then we did the USMCA. That's Mexico, Canada. We did a $40 billion a year deal with Japan, and we did a deal with South Korea, and we have other deals, too. And I'm going to India next week, and we're talking about, you know, they have 1.5 billion people. And Prime Minister Modi is number two on Facebook. Number two. Think of that. You know who number one is? Trump. Do you believe that? Trump. Number one. I just found out. The head of Facebook, Mr. Zuckerberg, came in three weeks ago. He said, congratulations. I said, on what? He said, you're number one on Facebook. I said, that's cool. Number one on Twitter, too. But that's because it's true. And if I wasn't, I could never say it, because it would be breaking news that, <laughs> that Trump told the fib. <laughs> no, number one. And I congratulated uh, Prime Minister Modi. I said, but you know, you have 1.5 billion people. I have 350 million. You have an advantage. But we're going to India, and we may make a tremendous deal there. Maybe we'll slow it down. We'll do it after the election. I think that could happen, too. So we'll see what happens. But we're only making deals if they're good deals, because we're putting America first. Whether people like it or not, we're putting America first. So to help you find housing, jobs, and support, I established, as you know very well, the Council on Crime Prevention and Reentry. They've done a fantastic job. And here with us today are our new executive director, Tony Loudon. Tony. Would you just come up and say a few words, please? Tony Loudon. Thank you, Tony. He looks good. Thank you, sir. To God be the glory. Listen, this is what reentry looks like. When our law enforcement, our returning citizens, our faith community, business and our community, along with their children, can come together in a holistic approach and bring us together. Under this president has showed America what reentry looks like. They say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But I want to tell you that today, the entire world have been put on notice that here, John, under this president and our administration, this will no longer be a secret. This will be the norm for America. God bless you. Thank you, wow. Thank you Tony. Wow. Thank you, Tony. Wow, that's great. Respected guy. For too long, citizens with a record were not even considered for jobs. You know that. Even if they were qualified, rehabilitated totally, and ready to go to work, they wanted to go to work. But all of that is changing. And we began a nationwide campaign to encourage businesses to expand second chance hiring. We call it second chance hiring. When we say hire American, we mean all Americans. All Americans. <laughs> And our entire nation wins when citizens with a record of a chance to succeed. It's such a tremendous — what's happened over the last three years is incredible. Uh, people came out, they didn't have a chance. And now they're not only having a chance, you're going to see in a little while when these guys try to make a deal. I want a little bit more. Give me a little bit more. <laughs> Together, we're rebuilding the most prosperous economy and the most inclusive society, John, ever to exist. We are becoming a very inclusive society, much more so than in the past. And a lot of people haven't figured that out yet, but I think they will. I think people are going to figure it out pretty soon. We want every citizen to join America's unparalleled success and every community to take part in America's extraordinary rise. Since my election, we have created 7 million new jobs. The unemployment rate has reached the lowest rate 
in over 51 years. Think of that, 51 years, half a century. And by the way, the 7 million jobs, they thought it might be 2 million if we're lucky. You go back three years, they were saying 2 million. We did 7 million, and it's pretty amazing. African-American poverty has declined to the lowest rate ever recorded. But I think one of the things we're most proud of in this incredible economy, we'll call it Trump economy, call it, uh, we'll call it the ponder economy, we'll call it something. <laughs> but whatever we call it, this economy has been great. And the thing that might be the best of all is what we've done with criminal justice reform. I really think so. <laughs> Our jobs market is so strong that businesses are recruiting the former prisoners off the sidelines in, by the way, record numbers, record numbers. Never happened anywhere even close to these numbers. We know that having a job gives you the best chance to work hard, to earn the paycheck, care for your families, chase your dreams, and succeed. Through our pledge to America's workers, spearheaded by a very famous young woman. Did you ever hear of Ivanka? She's good. She's She's, she said, Daddy, I want to help with jobs. I said, well, I'll put you here, there. They, no, no, I want to help with jobs. I want to get people jobs. They have to be trained. They have to be. So she had a goal of 500,000 jobs. That's a lot, half a million jobs. She just broke Jared, I guess. Is Jared around? She just broke. She just broke Jared Kushner. She just broke the father of criminal justice reform. He really is. I mean, he works so hard. And Ivanka just broke 15 million jobs, 15. Mayor, that's good, right? And this is where they, they train the people in the companies. The government can't do this. Uh, Walmart took a million people. Think of it. These big companies take — and they train them. It's very complicated stuff with computerization and all the things you have to learn. That's not for government. 15 million people taken by Many of the biggest companies, but also mid-sized companies, even some smaller. But she broke 15 million people about two weeks ago. And her goal was 500,000 people over a fairly long period of time, 15 million. But if you know Ivanka, you're not at all surprised, believe me. I wasn't surprised. I was sort of saying, so what else is new? To every returning citizen here today, I know that there are some in our society who want to tell you what you can't do. They're going to tell you what you can't do. It's one of the reasons I wanted to be here. I wanted to say what I had to say to John, too, because I sort of had that in my mind for a long time, actually the first time I met him. But they want to tell you what you can't do. They want to tell you why you can't succeed. No way you can succeed. You don't want to listen to that because you're proving different. They want to say why you can't make it in this country, why you can't make it in any country. They, they think you're not going to make it, period. But do not believe those voices for one second, because I'm here today because I believe in what you can do. You're going to be incredible. You're going to be incredible. You're going to see it, and it's going to go quickly. Each of you is a citizen of the greatest country on Earth. There is more opportunity, more equality, and more potential in America today than in any society in the history of the world. It's true. This is the country where anyone can make a comeback. We made a comeback with our country. We call it the Great American Comeback. This is the Great American Comeback, and you're doing the same thing. This is a nation where anyone can rise, and this is the time when anyone can reach for the American dream, that beautiful American dream. That's what you're doing. <laughs> and whenever you have any doubt, Whenever the road gets tough, and it will, you'll have those days. I've had those days. <laughs> I mean, I didn't do anything wrong, and they impeached me a few weeks ago, right? <laughs> they impeached. I said, what happened? What did I do? Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> you think that was fun, Mayor? You think that's great to be impeached? The good news, my numbers went through the roof. I mean, you explain. <laughs> explain this to me. Explain this to me. But you'll have those days, right? You're going to have those days. But you're Americans, and you're great Americans. And Americans meet challenges. You defy expectations. You never give up. 
you never lose faith in the redeeming power of Almighty God. And from this day forward, I'm here. I'm the president. I don't have to do this. I could be someplace else. But I wanted to be here. And we, I had plenty of choices. One thing as president, the mayor can tell you, we have plenty of choices, right? We have a lot of choices. I wanted to be here. But I ask each of you to seize your unlimited future. If you do, you will make the most of your incredible newfound freedom. You're pioneers in a way because you're at a point in the country when it's just all come together. You will unlock your unique talents and skill and aspirations. You'll join a great project of national renewal. And together, we will make our country stronger than ever before. Thank you very much for being here. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you. the graduates to uh, line up as we issue the uh, certificates. Gary White. Maceo Wells. Demarcus Webb. Richard Bella. Amanda Stankowitz. Jared Robinson. Nathan Rabb. Troy Price. Frank Pravada. Pura Pazzo. Robert Petrozino. Herman Pacheco. Sydney Morris. Casey Mix. Heath McCurdy. Pahan McCaspack.
DeAndre Houston. Delirious Hernandez. Lay Harris. Michael Hargraves. Aaron Hairston. O.C. Gwynn. Saul Guevara. Jared Gibson. Glenn Fennell. Sarah Campbell. Willie Bro. Rory Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, as I present to you the February special graduating class of, of 2020. And Mr. President, we just want to thank you so very, very much. It is an honor for us to have you in this building. Thank you so very much. Well, was that not just amazing? <laughs> to have a visit from the President of the United States, thank you guys so very much for coming out and spending this time as we celebrated the men and women uh, that are here. And I see people telling me to, to do this right here, so I'm going to just keep doing this right here. <laughs> Captain Burke, what does that even mean like that? But I want to take a few minutes as we're uh, departing uh, to thank all of our supporters. I want to thank my board of directors that are here uh, today. Thank you guys so very, very much. Could not do it without you, right? Any success that the organization has shared uh, is because you guys are uh, our go-to people. I want to thank our supporters here, my staff, uh, volunteer mentors that are here in this room. I uh, just want to thank you and say thank you for coming out, making this, making this all possible. 
I do want to take a minute to, to share with you that uh, I will be in Washington, D.C. with the president on uh, March the 31st-ish um, as he signs a proclamation declaring the month of April of 2020 the month of second chances. And in that month of second chances, the wording in that proclamation is encouraging communities across the country to acknowledge and appreciate and encourage second chance hiring. It is to uh, ask them to celebrate the men and women who have completed their prison system, their prison sentence, and now out in the community and are flourishing. So on that day, we are going to have an event on April the 21st at the Texas station. We are putting on a second chance luncheon. And inside this luncheon, what we're going to be doing is we're inviting formerly incarcerated people from all over the country to come and attend. These are men and women who have served their prison sentence back in their community. Now they're out 10, 15, 20 years. And not only have they never gone back, but today they're in their community living levels of life that most people only dream of. But what we do is we use that as a platform to show the nation that there is a segment of the population who we go to prison, we pay our debt to society, and we come home and then begin to do things in our community and so what we're doing is we're inviting those folks out. And some of the, some of the, the, the grassroots leaders from across our country that are going to be there, they're doing very impressive, phenomenal things. And, and when we use that as a platform to show people that this is how we are changing the face of reentry. This is how the doors continue to open up for other formerly incarcerated people who are coming out. So if you would go to our website at hopeforprisons.org, and you click on the pop-up there, it'll give you all the information about that event. I want to encourage everyone in this room to participate in that. You know, there's sponsorship opportunities for your, those of you who may want to consider a sponsorship. There are, are, are table opportunities there. There, 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 there are opportunities to, to uh, you know, purchase a ticket. But I'd just like to encourage you that if what you've seen here today with the President of the United States being here in this room and celebrating uh, these men and women who are coming home, you know, there's something deep down in my spirit that is saying that as an organization, we are just scratching the surface. But in order for us to be able to continue to do that, we're going to need your support. We're going to need your prayers. We're going to need you to be able to get, uh, to continue to get involved. We're going to need, you know, uh, finances, donations to help us to continue this great work that we're doing. And please don't understand that any dollar that you give to Hope for Prisoners, you are sowing this, a seed into lives of people. And not only are you going to impact them, but this is an incredible opportunity for you to impact the next great generation of the families to come. But again, I just want to, I want to say thank you uh, for those of you who have, have supported. Uh, and there's one lady, and I'm not going to mention any names, of who has done some great things for our organization. Uh, we would not be standing here uh, without, you know, if, you, what, if it wasn't for you. And you know exactly who it is that I'm talking to. I want to thank my beautiful wife, Jamie, and my two little girls, <laughs> Promise and Liberty. Did they not do an amazing job on the national? I mean, the Pledge of Allegiance. Good job. So I just want to say thank you. And are we ready to release right now? Because I'm ready to get up out of here. <laughs> Again, thank you guys so very, very much. And we'll, we'll hopefully we'll see you guys down in April.